39. Told David we had a good crowd tonight. We appreciate all of you being here. And uh, the singing, uh, obviously, is representative of the fact that uh, we do have a good crowd. And we appreciate so much all of you that uh, have made the effort to be here uh, tonight. Uh, I think we've got our PowerPoint working. For some reason or another, it was malfunctioning this morning, and I don't know exactly what was going on. And uh, you and I uh, are rarely ever satisfied. Anybody in here tonight satisfied? Three or four of you. <laughs> Not very many. <laughs> Well, I hope you'll understand uh, where I'm going tonight with this. Never satisfied in life. We see it all the time. You ask people that, you know, and a lot of people say, well, I'm just never satisfied. They can get up from a big meal and you say, well, how, how was it? Well, it didn't really satisfy me. Have you ever heard people say that? Didn't satisfy my need. Well, uh, have you ever known anyone? Uh, who couldn't be satisfied. Uh, maybe you can't satisfy your mate for some reason or another. You do all the right things, but, uh, you know, you just can't satisfy one another. Well, uh, sometimes you just can't do enough for certain people. They want more and more and more. Now, I want us to uh, take a look tonight at something that you may think is a little bit strange, but in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 15 and 16, the Bible says that there are three things that are never satisfied. And then he says, no, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the thirsty desert, and the blazing fire. And I want us to look at every one of those tonight. There are four things that are really mentioned in this particular text and you may have never really thought about it. You know, there's so many passages of Scripture in the Word of God that we read and we read over and we just pass over it and never really, really learn from it. Well, I want to tell you tonight, first of all, do you know that the grave is never satisfied? It isn't. The door of death, as I've suggested here, has a no vacancy sign on it. Death never, ever takes a holiday, and it never fails to uh, actually accommodate one more person who is going to die. It is never satisfied. It amazes me in the Bible when, as I mentioned this morning, that little phrase, and he died. If you were to go to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 5, you would find where the Bible talks about uh, death. And it talks about those that have died. Do you know that there are 3,400 people that die every hour? So during the time that you and I will be meeting here tonight, in the span of one hour, 3,400 people all over the world will die. Do you know that in a year, there are 30 million that die? The population of the... 9 million, but think about 30 million people, universally speaking, I'm not talking about the United States, but universally speaking, all over the world will die in a year's time. But in the book of Genesis chapter 5, the Bible lists a number of people that die. Seth in verse 5, Enos in verse 8, uh, Canaan in verse 11. Uh, Maalil in uh, verse 14, Jared in verse 17, verse 19, Enoch, you've heard of him because he was the father of Methuselah who also died uh, down in verse 27. And Methuselah lived to be 969 years of age. Boy, that's amazing, isn't it? Well, maybe Jesse's got a chance <laughs> at 102, who knows? <laughs> Lamech died in verse 31. Now, I've said all that to tell you that the grave really is never, ever satisfied. Uh, this particular verse tells us that all of us are going to die. We're going to come to grips with that one thought at some point in our life. We are going to die. There's nearly 700, excuse me, 7 billion people 
on, uh, on the, in living in the world right now as I speak. But the death rate is still one per person. You will die. And as someone has appropriately said that the uh, backhoes and the grave diggers are always working because someone is dying or getting ready to die. And when Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he had these great words to say. And he reminds us, if you will, of the fact that death is real. He said in chapter 3 and verse 3 that there is a time to be born and a time to die. God has designated it for all of us. That's 3,400 people uh, every hour. 57 graves will be dug in the next 67. Does that speak with morbidity to you? I'm not trying to make you morbid and feel bad tonight. I'm just telling you that it happens. It does happen, and no one escapes it. For the book of Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointment that you and I will keep. You know, we make a lot of appointments. We make doctor's appointments. We make uh, appointments maybe. Uh, many of you have already made appointments to get your corona. Uh, virus vaccine and uh, a lot of people will keep those some do not keep them after they make them for some reason or another uh, there are a lot of people that make appointments down at the auto mechanic shop that may never show up but I'm going to tell you something you will keep your appointment with death for it is an appointment that God made for you. You didn't have to make that appointment. Most of the time, we make our own appointments. I have an appointment with the doctor in the morning, early hours. And, uh, you know, uh, I made that appointment. But God made the appointment of death for every one of us. And no one, no one escapes it. And age is not really a factor through the years, I uh, <clears throat> have spoken at over 1,500 funerals here in Palestine, Texas. And uh, many of those have been for teenagers, young babies that were still born, for some who lived to be that ripe old age of 100 years. And it is amazing, isn't it? And when you walk through the cemetery, you will notice that there is um, actually graves for almost every age. Uh, it'll have the date of their birth and the date of their death. Some live to be, as we call it, a ripe old age. Others died maybe in infancy. And so the grave is never satisfied. Funeral homes are never satisfied, are they, Ben? <laughs> now, uh, what I'm trying to say to you is the fact that death is real. And when Solomon wrote this, he's trying to remind us this is one of the things that are never satisfied. And the grave cries out for more and more and more. Never, ever satisfied. You know, Dwight and I were talking a minute ago coming into the facility here. Uh, remember Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones? They had a song that was called Can't Get No Satisfaction. You remember that one? Even though I cry and cry and cry, you're crying about the wrong things. And uh, there's the song we sing, even the one that we sang this morning, David, uh, I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. How many of y'all are satisfied with a cottage below? I don't know too many folks that are satisfied with a cottage below. We want a nice home. How many are satisfied with a little silver and a little gold, as the song says? Most people are not. But those of you that are satisfied, you can give me what you have left. <laughs> people are already talking about their stimulus check. Can't wait to get that stimulus check. And when President Biden goes into office, I understand there's going to be a chicken on every plate and a king in every house. That's comforting to know, isn't it? Never satisfied. Secondly... The barren womb is never satisfied. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. There is something within a woman that longs for a child. My sister could not have children. She adopted two children because of her great love for children. But... Physically, she could not. 
conceive and have children. And we've talked about it on numerous occasions. And she said, even though I've adopted children, there's that longing to have children. And there is within a woman that longing for a child. The innermost desire of a born-again Christian is to win others to Christ, isn't it? It is to me. I mean, I'm thrilled when I can teach someone about Jesus and, and bring another child of God into the fold that we call the church. You will never be completely spiritually satisfied until you begin to reach others for our Lord and for our Master. Nothing else will satisfy. You could experience all the pleasures of the world and you wouldn't be satisfied. Entertainment doesn't, as I suggested here, satisfy you. Job advancement, a lot of people say, well, I'd just be satisfied if I had another job and, and I was happy with that job. Let me tell you something. Job advancement is never going to satisfy your needs, no more than it satisfies the needs of a woman who has no children. And the barrenness of the soul will cry out, dissatisfied. Never satisfied. That's what God says. There's just that longing within a woman to have children. Audrey's sister could not have children, wanted to have. There are many in this congregation that do not have biological children. Some have adopted children, and that's great. We commend that, and we think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. And all three of my sisters, or, th or three of them, well, actually had adopted children. Actually, four of them. I forgot I had a four sister, but anyway... <laughs> but adopted children, and that's wonderful. Those children need homes, and they need love. And Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, excuse me, Romans 10 and verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. But the Bible also says in that text in Proverbs chapter 30, if you go back and read it, that the dry ground is never satisfied. What do we mean by that? We're always wanting it to rain, aren't we? <laughs> I was watching the forecast for the coming week. Looks like we're going to get about four days of moisture again upon the earth if the meteorologists are right, and uh, we pray about it. But how many of you remember all those terrible Texas droughts that we had uh, over the last 10 or so years? You remember there were many of them, and it was so dry and uh, you could even see large cracks in the soil. It was so dry. And we were praying for rain, and no one brought an umbrella. No one. I took a water hose and let it run in some of those cracks at my house for several minutes. But one thing I noticed, that what, what Solomon prophesied and what he said is so true, it never did fill up. It just kept running. And as it continued to run, I kept seeing my water bill. But that's the way it is, isn't it? But you know what? Through all that time, I found an ingenious way to water my yard. <laughs> if you don't have a sprinkler system, perhaps this might work for you. I don't know. But I know one thing. I know that drought is terrible and that the ground is never satisfied as a whole. That's what Solomon says. The earth is a type of humanity. And that's why he brings this out. All of this is analogous of the human's form in our world. And water, believe it or not, is a type of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you read in the book of John chapter 4, and I mentioned Jesus going to the community of Sychar and how he went there and Christ said to that woman at the well, when he asked her for a drink, she gave it and she said, how is it that you, uh, being a Jew, would ask a Samaritan for a drink of water? And he says, well, you know what? <laughs> you give me one and I'm going to give you one. And the water that I will give you will well up. It will, he said, it will spring up within your spirit. 
and you will never ever thirst again. In the book of Isaiah 44 and verse 3, the prophet said, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing shall be upon your or thine offspring. The dry ground is never satisfied, nor is mankind. We're never satisfied. We're not. We, we say we are sometimes, but we're never satisfied. Do you have pain? Are you satisfied with pain? No, you're not satisfied with pain. It hurts. You don't like it. You want it to go away. We're all dissatisfied in some form or another. King David, in uh, one of the darkest hours of his life, uh, realized his need for the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And in Psalms 51 and verse 11, he says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, sometimes people think that the Holy Spirit was an afterthought of God and that he was going to follow Christ in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit has been in existence from the very beginning, just like God the Son and God the Father. And so David is saying, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And the absence of the Holy Spirit will bring defeat, and it will bring discouragement. It does. All the time, doesn't it? You can chalk it up. In Psalms 42, verse 1 and 2, we sing a song about this particular passage of Scripture. As the heart, or as a, a heart as a deer, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So what David is saying here, just like that deer pants after the water. You ever seen a deer pant after water? You ever seen the souls of men pant after the Holy Spirit of our God who is in heaven. There is no measure. You can't measure the misery of man who is empty and who is thirsty for God. In recent months, I've had the opportunity to baptize a number of people into Christ. And I thank God for, even in the midst of this great pandemic, souls are still thirsting for God. And hungering. Jesus said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We sing that song, there's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Why would we say that about a fountain? Because we want the fountain of the living God, the Holy Spirit that quenches our thirst. It's a longing that has never yet been totally satisfied. Several, actually just a few years ago, one of our members here, and they were newly converted, and they ended up moving away. I hope they're still faithful. But he would say to me, he says, you know, I just hate to leave the building. <laughs> I just still want to be here and, and absorbing the word of God. I just hate to leave the building and go back out into the wicked world. I want the world tonight to know the one that loves them so. It's like a flame that is burning deep within our soul. And Jeremiah said that. And that thirst is never, ever totally satisfied. But then he mentions, fourthly, something else. And he says, the fires of hell are never satisfied. The devil cries for more. Just one more. Just one more. There's not enough. 
we need another. And the Bible says, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. The fire of hell never says, well, we've got enough now. Never satisfied. Proverbs 27, 20, the Bible says that hell and destruction are never full. We always talk about the fact that hell is full of people. Well, <laughs> they may have a lot of them, but they're not full. But hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. What an analogy, Solomon. He makes a poignant point, doesn't he not? Hell has been enlarged to accommodate the multitudes. I know that because of what this passage says in the book of Isaiah 5 and verse 14. For therefore hell hath enlarged herself and hath opened her mouth without measure. I think it's interesting that the Bible, uh, at least uh, metaphorically speaking, describes the measurements of heaven. It is the city that lies four square. And John even gives the dimensions, how high, how wide, how tall. But it doesn't say that about hell. Hell has no measurements. It's so like he said, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and has opened her mouth without measure. Satan is not concerned with how many are now condemned to hell, for he wants one more because hell is never satisfied. And Jesus said three times in the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, that the fire is not quenched. It does not go out. The fire of hell never burns itself out. Most fires will eventually burn itself out if you don't stoke the coals and maybe put on another log or another piece of wood or something. They don't have to do that in hell. For the fire will never, ever burn out. It is never quenched. And hell is never satisfied. There are those who tell us that hell is not real. Have you ever heard people say that? Hell is not real. Listen to Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. What did he say? Everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. God does not intend for any of us to go to hell. doesn't want us to go to hell. He has provided a way for us to escape the jaws of that eternal abyss. From the fiery flames of torment. For in Matthew 7, 13, he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. We hear a lot of wrong concepts. You know, President Trump talks about all the fake news, and there's a lot of it floating around today on the internet and uh, on Facebook and uh, it's like someone told us the other day they said who in the world do you believe you hear all this but who do you believe I don't know about that and I couldn't tell you what to believe about it but I can tell you what to believe about this here and I can tell you what to believe about the book of Proverbs chapter 30 but sometimes we hear the wrong message from hell today. There's not, it's not the cry of torment. It's not the weeping of a mother who was separated from her children. It's not the wailing of a father who ignored the warnings of hell. We don't hear the crying and the weeping of a teenager who didn't make ready for his earthly demise and separation. 
That's not what we hear from, you don't even hear it from many pulpits anymore. Preachers are afraid to get up and preach on it, folks. Instead, we hear hell's not hot. It's not real. No intelligent person believes in hell, they say. Well, I'm telling you, if their concept of intelligency is based upon whether you believe in hell or not, I'm an idiot. And you don't have to say amen. God wouldn't send a person to hell. What about that one? You ever heard people say that? God wouldn't send anyone to hell. You know what? People send themselves to hell. And these are all lies coming from the dissatisfied fires of hell. The four things that are never, ever satisfied. But you know what? I believe this. I put this on here because I believe it very strongly. Every person in hell right now believes in hell. In that place of torment, in that Hadean world where the fires are not quenched also, the Bible describes it that way. One last thought. Not what is never satisfied, but what is satisfied. What does satisfy the longing of the soul? Jesus does that. In the book of Psalms 107 and verse 9, David said, For he satisfies the longing of the soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He satisfies. He's the only one who can. Isaiah 58 and verse 11, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and shall satisfy thy soul in drought. You know why sometimes the brethren are in drought is because all they do is come to church and they hear a dry, warmed over sermon. They never hear anything that challenges them. They never hear anything about how do you get closer to God or what do I need to do to get my life right. He guides us continually and he satisfies our soul in drought. And he makes fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail Jeremiah 31, 14, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. You know, you can have all the money in the world and still not be satisfied. But if you have Jesus and you have no money, you're satisfied. Because you know, what we're doing here in this life is temporal. There should be the longing within us for the eternal in heaven. In closing, someone penned these words, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see, but there's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the song says. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. I hope you found your satisfaction in God tonight. And if you haven't, I hope you'll turn to him. He's the only one that can satisfy the longing of your soul. That's what God says. Maybe you've been searching for that for a long time. Hadn't found it yet. But you can find it tonight. 
You can come and penitently believe in Jesus and be baptized that all your sin may be washed away and God can use that water to cleanse your body by the blood of Jesus Christ and your spirit. And when we stray from God, isn't it comforting to know that he is there again to restore the water of life to barren ground? Let us stand and let us sing.